Hi, I'm Jamie Stegmeyer, and you're listening to Board Chitless. Tonight's episode of Board Chitless is sponsored by The Game Steward. The Game Steward is an online game store offering Kickstarter board games out of print and imported games at reasonable prices. It's time to play. So on today's episode of Board Chitless, we're delighted to have with us uh, our special guest, Jamie Stegmeyer. Jamie Stegmeyer of Stonemeyer Games is no less than a legend in the board game industry. A passionate and creative game designer who has not only launched numerous high-quality big-selling titles like Viticulture and Charterstone and Scythe, Jamie has also made a name for himself by being a gigantic influencer in the community, sharing his experiences of game design, publishing, community management, and much more through his many honest and helpful blogs, and also his book, A Crowdfunder's Strategy Guide, which, uh, to be fair, I use this book numerous times. I refer to it all the time through an art during our Kickstarter campaigns, and I strongly recommend it to anyone thinking of launching their own sort of crowdfunding project. Um, so Jamie, welcome to the show. How the heck are you feeling today? I'm doing great. That was such a wonderful introduction. I think you you pretty much covered everything there. So Okay, we're done. Goodbye. We're yeah, that's it. <laughs> Never fear. It'll be, surely it'll be plagiarized from Wikipedia somewhere. No interest in <laughs> I don't think yeah, I'm so, on Wikipedia, actually. I, that's, that's like well, a dream. That's Someday I'll have a Wik- Wikipedia page. Well, that's, that's going to be the target of your next blog then, Jamie. I'll have to, uh, how, how to get on Wikipedia, how to nail yeah. <laughs> Wikipedia. It's, it's something I did actually look at one time, trying to get um, one of my games on there, and then gave up after about an hour of fruitless Google foo. <laughs> revealing I, think, no well, I think the secret is you need to get somebody else to write it, but you, yeah. then you, you're in their hands, really. Oh, right. So they could say anything. <laughs> right. You just got to hope that the editors know what they're doing. It'd have to be someone you really trust. Right. <laughs> Maybe. Right. We'll we'll see what yours says about you. In a, in a <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very threatening, like it. <laughs> okay, so uh, Jamie, let's can we start at the beginning with yourself? Assuming the extremely unlikely situation that our listeners haven't heard of you, can you tell us about yourself, uh, your gaming interest, and how you got started in board game design in the first place? Yeah. So as you mentioned in the in the intro, in the intro, I run a company called Stillmeyer Games. Um, I've been a gamer all of my life. I was lucky to have parents that connected me with board games when I was very young. And I started designing games when I was very young, but just for fun. Then Kickstarter became a thing, you know, about 10 years ago. I was fascinated by it, and I decided to combine my hobby of board game design with my love for entrepreneurship and my curiosity for Kickstarter itself. And that's how Viticulture came to be. So Kickstarter started 10 years ago. Viticulture, you kickstarted, was it in 2012? Yeah, it was in August of, of 2012. So I, I had followed Kickstarter for a while, I, and I started yeah. to see board game projects on it. And then um, I started working on Viticulture in the fall of 2011, and then launched it in 2012. You see, that's brilliant, because that's almost about, you know, it's a couple of years of R&D looking into Kickstarter, how it works as a, um, as a community, and how it works as a platform before you've jumped in. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which is probably like absolutely brilliant advice for fledgling um, board game designers out there. Don't just try and jump in straight with the project, but look look at what the marketplace is doing and how you can react to that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, I created a big spreadsheet over that time over uh, for projects I backed and projects I was just curious about and watching, comparing like what they did back then. A lot of people were doing early birds. People have moved away from that a little bit, but like I had that on the spreadsheet to see how products did early birds, how they did premium pricing and all this different stuff that influenced what I did for Viticulture. That research then, is that what led you to building up a following before you launched Viticulture? How did you sort of build the community for that campaign? Well, you know, honestly, I didn't do a particularly good job before that campaign of building a community in advance. I, I've written a personal blog for a long, long time. Um, it doesn't have a lot of followers, uh, more of a consistent, small following. Um, and so that was, that was part of my community building effort, but really a, a lot of the things I learned from Viticulture were mistakes that I made because I didn't have much of a community. I wasn't all that active in what I have now discovered to be a wonderfully robust, um, board game community on, on Facebook and board game geek and Twitter and other places, Instagram. Um, yeah. but I wasn't really involved in that. And so I really, one of the things that made that first campaign a success is that I, I went all out the first few days of contacting friends and family members to help them get the campaign off the, or help me get the campaign off the ground. And without that, it, nothing else I think would have existed with my company. Wow. So, right. Well, it's a lot more sort of experimental than I was expecting, to be honest. Cause yeah. um, yeah. I mean, every Kickstarter campaign is an experiment in itself, I suppose, but in, 
going back to 2012, you didn't really uh, have that many other board game campaigns, I guess, to sort of learn from. You know, you were one of the pioneers in that respect. Right. Yeah, there really weren't that many. Um, Tasty Minstrel Games was on there, Crash Games, uh, a few others. I think Ryan Lockett of Red Raven Games had a campaign or two at that point. But um, they were, especially compared to today's campaigns, they were very small. Um, they raised, I think, some of the better ones raised maybe $50,000, $60,000. And uh, there wasn't very much information about there about how to plan for and run an effective Kickstarter campaign. So I was just kind of winging it based on what I saw from other campaigns. Yeah. Well, I suppose to some, to some extent, Kickstarter itself didn't really know um, what what people should be doing. I remember it launching um, a, a few FAQs saying, well, this is how you prove that your project can actually run off the ground if you do succeed in funding. And these are questions that people might be asking you. Um, and that was quite seems quite recent ago now, probably about five or six years ago. So I think, you know, the, the community itself was still trying to work out how how do we re regulate these um, campaigns and how do we know if campaigns are going to be fulfilled. Yeah, it was still fledgling, wasn't it, I suppose? Yeah. And, and there was that risk that you were backing someone's idea. There's, it's very much taken for granted at, at this point in time now, if a Kickstarter runs, you expect the goods, yeah. you know, you expect the board game out the other end of it. But going back to 2012, well... I'm making an assumption here, Jamie, but perhaps there was still the uh, idea in the community that you were just risking your investment in Kickstarter and that it wasn't guaranteed that you'd get your stuff, maybe. Yeah, yeah it felt less retail and more perspective, didn't it, I suppose? It did, yeah. Back in a dream. <laughs> yeah. And they were, they were definitely touching upon that as well. There were, there were more projects back then that felt a little bit more like concepts or ideas rather than... Um, you know, games that are ready to go to print and they just need the money to afford the manufacturing cost. That, yeah. That's changed a Absolutely. lot. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the um, the first game I backed on Kickstarter was Kingdom Death Monster and there was no rule book, there was no gameplay videos, there was nothing. It was like one guy's ideas, um, right. you know, and then luckily he created a great game off the back of it, but there was, there was very little evidence of that up front. Um, so, I mean... Obviously, the scene's changed a lot in the last few years. How, how has your experience of um, Kickstarter, Jamie, changed over, you know, the number of campaigns that you've done culminating most recently on Kickstarter with, with Scythe, which was, you know, a mega hit? I guess there, I mean, there are two perspectives, one as a backer and one as a creator. As a backer, I've been pretty consistent over the past few years. I usually back a few projects a month. I follow a lot more just out of curiosity and because I still write a lot about Kickstarter. Um, so as a backer, not much has changed. As a creator, a lot has changed. As you said, my last campaign was Scythe, which ended in the fall of 2015, so I think November 2015. And later that year after I fulfilled on that campaign, I decided that I was going to move away from Kickstarter. Um, nothing against Kickstarter itself at all, but rather... Uh, it just was making choices for my company based on risk management um, and my time. I, I run the company. I, a lot of people influence the company, but I am the only one running the company on a day-to-day -day basis. And it takes a lot of time, as you know, to run a Kickstarter campaign. So I kind of yeah. cut that out. Um, and so since then, I, I haven't run any Kickstarters. Come out with a number of products and games since then uh, without using Kickstarter. And it's, it's been nice. I miss it a little bit because it is really yeah. exciting to be in that thrill of a, a you know, the, of a, of a moment or a month long moment of Kickstarter. But uh, for the most part, I'm, I'm glad we've changed our strategy a little bit. I suppose you've outgrown Kickstarter now in terms of a company. Um, you know, you've, you've built up some game designs, you've taken them through production, you've built up a network of producers, you, you know, you just have printers that you know and trust. And also now um, almost maybe some capital as well. So you, while you have that control to move a game through design and development and then into production, then it almost seems like going through a funding platform like Kickstarter might, like you're saying, it just slow you down. Why not be a bit leaner? Yeah, I mean, yeah, those are those are among some of the things that that I've taken into consideration. Like, I I love Kickstarter for a number of reasons, and you mentioned the funding. The funding is is a big part of it. Um, yeah. But also the idea of building a community, of making a project or a product better, of, of gauging demand for a product, yeah, and uh, and the marketing, the buzz aspect of it. I, I found that I, I my company, 
after Scythe was at a place where I could do all those things. If I put in the time and effort, I could do all those things without using Kickstarter. Um, so I yeah. still think it's a wonderful platform for those things. It's just n perhaps not as necessary as um, sometimes I think we assume it to be because it's just a little bit easier on Kickstarter to get those things done. Yeah, because you, you're getting the funding up front. So that's why uh, companies like uh, Come On are still using it as a platform, even though um, you know it could be argued that they've got the reach now to be able to go straight to retail. Uh, from their point of view, I guess having the funds up front is a great way of just mitigating risk. Oh, yeah. Would you say that the main sort of element of your decision to move away from Kickstarter is perhaps to do with personal time then? You know, because um, a month-long campaign doesn't sound like long time, but emotionally, <laughs> it's, uh, it's incredibly draining, right? Oh, yeah. And in fact, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that side of it uh, because it uh, time is a big part of it, but also the uh, the emotional drain. Like, like Exactly like you said, it, it, was, um, it was surprising to me like it, if I go back and read the blog entries I wrote in the summer of 2016 when we were fulfilling Scythe, there's like a like most of my blog entries over over time are very positive or at least constructive, but they they get kind of dark during that summer. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I was I, I was going through like just an emotional uh, I don't know I don't know what it was, but it, it, it like was like a come down. Uh, yeah, and it and it I. I, as someone, a few people ended up pointing it out to me. I kind of snapped out of it and realized, oh, this was this thing that, that is wonderful. Kickstarter is wonderful. This thing is doing something that is not wonderful to me, and I need to be aware of that and and do something about it. So yeah, it's, oh, that's, it, have you guys ever felt? That? I mean, with uh, with with Gloom of Killforth, uh, did you ever feel that uh, that weight? A hundred percent. Yeah, um, I was I, probably much less prepared than you, Jamie, before uh, I ran the first Kickstarter for that. And I made this crazy decision to have like nearly 300 pieces of unique artwork and um, one artist. So it took us two years to fulfill. Um, and throughout that time, it was like an emotional roller coaster because, you know, I'd, as soon as I thought we were making progress, we'd, other logistical issues would come up and we'd be 10 steps back. And I had to keep everyone up to date and um, buoyant about the project, even though this weight was becoming interminable. Um, and the sort of my naivety in thinking that I could juggle that and a full time job um, led me to, you know, some nights of two or three hours sleep. And, and then that affects your mood and, and stuff. So, you know, I don't, I don't want to dwell too much on the pitfalls of Kickstarter, but it, there, there are negatives that perhaps aren't always the focus of the discussion, you know, when we're talking about the the platform well that's it and i suppose i mean you'll you be able to tell us jamie you had very successful kickstarter campaigns before scythe but then when scythe drops you got about seventeen thousand plus backers pledging over one million eight hundred and ten thousand dollars so compare that to your previous kickstarters could this sudden like that extra like that extra financial pressure of this game is being just so much bigger. I've got to produce so many more copies. The game itself is bigger. There's, you know, all these like um, miniatures as well. Could do you think that could have played quite a large part in how you were feeling then post campaign? Well, par partially, I, I think like one of the things that surprised me is that by all accounts, uh, it, it was a very successful campaign. Like you said, it was a lot of people, a lot of money. We delivered it early to everybody um earlier than we than we estimated and from the vast majority of backers the feedback i heard was that it exceeded their expectations of what it would be and yet i was feeling this this weight that we that we're talking about yeah. um so that was that juxtaposition of hey everything's going well but i'm still feeling this way about it that was a big red flag to me that i need to do something about it i see so the, fee the feedback's coming back positive but yet you're still feeling quite negative and dark about it Exactly. Yeah. And I think part of that is due to like as, as positive as a lot of it was there, there were um, like a small percentage of backers who it wasn't necessarily about the product itself, but uh, there, there was just some elements of human nature that came out during the fulfillment process that didn't make me excited to engage with those backers. And that was new too, because I <laughs> love my backers. You know, I, you guys have experienced this too. It's wonderful how to have these people share this passion for this thing that you love so much. Um, but at the same at the same time, there was a small percentage that was just acting in ways that I, that baffled me. That's a, a beautifully tactical <laughs> way of putting it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think it's no surprise at all. Uh, well, 
it was when you to hear you say it, but it, it with hindsight, it does it makes perfect sense that you would feel the pressure and not just like the emotional pressure of having to go through all that to, to manage backers, um, but also the logistical nightmare of fulfilling something that's you've gone from you know a few thousand backers to nearly twenty thousand. It's a completely different scale of logic, but um. Rather than sort of dwelling <laughs> on oh, that course, element for no. too long, I was just going to um, switch track a bit and talk about your engagement with the community because obviously, as you said, you know, you that's that was one of the elements that you're so passionate about. You also have these incredibly helpful blogs uh, and your book, which are packed full of information, tips. Um, you've even compiled lists of fulfillment agencies and all these different people that can contact. It's almost like a blow by blow for anybody else, how to run a Kickstarter, manage a campaign, all of that, all of those valuable golden nuggets of information, Jamie, are hugely valuable bits of information for the enemy, for your competitors. <laughs> so what's all that about? <laughs> Can you explain to us your reasoning for uh, for sharing all this information that could perhaps give you the edge over the rest of the you know design and publishing community? <laughs> Well, I like the way you put that. For people who are, who are listening to this who are in the game industry, they probably know uh, that I, I don't think we, uh, fellow designers and publishers, I don't think most of us see each other as as enemies or as competitors. <laughs> but someone who's outside the industry listening to this, I don't know if there's anyone who's not a board game, who's not inside, they may not realize that. And it really is different, I think, than many other industries where we, at the very least, don't look to put each other down. We look to lift each other up. That's probably a yes. generalization to a certain extent, but I, that's what I've seen for most other people. Has, has that been your experience? Absolutely. No, it's it's insane how collaborative it is. I mean, I've, I've worked in various jobs for the past 20 years, but I've never seen an industry where technically uh, competitors, um, you know, of, of separate companies get yeah. together and talk about the thing that they're collectively passionate about, share tips with each other. We've had, um, on the show, we've had Isaac Childress, who did Gloomhaven, uh, which Gloomy Kilforth went toe-to-toe with, you know, um, ju- on Kickstarter during the launch. But, um, and we've had Frank West, who did another one-to-four player cooperative fantasy adventure game. Uh, but I think the the common sort of, there may be exceptions to this, but I think we kind of approach this as gamers like we would go into the movies. If you go and see Marvel Avengers Infinity Wars, that doesn't then prevent you from going to see Star Wars. You know, it's just there's more stuff, there's more media to consume, there's more games to play. And I think, and I hope, and it, it certainly seems to be my experience, my limited experience of the people that we've interviewed on the show, that everybody else is is reaching out and looking for the same things. You know, Isaac's emailed me and asked me questions about UK fulfillment and stuff. I've emailed him. He's given me tips on how to run Kickstarters and that. And everybody's trying to give each other a leg up because I think we're all working to prolong this, you know, and, and keep making games and keep making cool stuff for our fellow like-minded geeks <laughs> definitely definitely i mean just as an outsider looking into the game development world because I've, I've not yet produced a board game yet and i may <laughs> i may not um but just looking at um how tristan ran his um, kickstarter campaigns and then going to uk games expo with him and seeing how he then interacts with other game designers around and how how they interact with tristan but also with me so as a just as a games player really it's absolutely incredible how much information is shared but quite freely and just, everyone's just very positive about it everyone wants to hear what's going well with other campaigns everyone wants to hear what's maybe not gone so well but not so they can rub your face in it just so they can kind of learn from it and might be able to help you as well that's awesome yeah that, that's what yeah. i found too and and actually and one thing tristan you said about people asking each other for advice within the industry that's actually one of the reasons i had the blog that. Uh, yeah. especially after Scythe, I was getting, and, and the blog has been going for a while. This, this isn't like the reason I write the blog, but it is super helpful when someone emails me and says, hey, can you help me with this? Or I have a question about rewards or fulfillment. It it would be, a, it could potentially be a full-time job for me just to answer those emails. And so having the blog where I can just say, oh, I've written three articles about this. Go check it, it out. The link. <laughs> and, you know, if you have other questions, post them in the comments. Because I, I learn, I engage a lot in the comments and I learn a lot from other people from what they're asking or what they're sharing in the comments. So it's a nice resource for me even to, to deflect a little bit and save my time, but also still share uh, my observations and mistakes and insights with other people in a public way. Well, it's a fantastic resource. Um, w- one of the things I wanted to ask you about, Jamie, in terms of like game design and publishing and stuff is the 
relatively new emergent legacy games that are obviously happening all over the place. And your decision to jump in with uh, your own entry in the Legacy series with Charterstone, I believe, was the first Legacy game that you've developed. Could you talk to us about the process of that? Because that's not just designing and playtesting a board game. That's designing and playtesting a board game that's robust enough to change over the course of many games and um, evolve over those games and stay balanced throughout, which Charterstone manages beautifully, I might add. We played that with the family. That's going to be appearing in an upcoming podcast, no doubt. Um, but could you talk to us about your design choices and maybe the experiences and challenges of creating a replayable legacy game? And maybe uh, perhaps tie this into Rise of Fenris as well, the, the, side, the upcoming Scythe expansion. Yes, I, uh, we could talk for hours about this. I'll try to summarize <laughs> it in a few minutes. Um, I'll clear my schedule. <laughs> so <laughs> a lot of the origins of Charterstone are in other legacy games. Risk Legacy was the first one I played, then the other, the Pandemic Legacies, um, and my, my, some of my fascinations with those games emerged from the idea of unlocking new content, both for the element of surprise and discovery, but also the idea of unlocking new rules so that you could start out with a very basic rule set and expand and grow from there. And so yeah. Yeah. that was something I played around with a lot in Charterstone. At certain points throughout the design process, there was either like a full rule book up front or no rule book at all. Like the, the rule book was completely blank. And yeah. I found through playtesting that um, I had to strike a balance there, that, that playtesters didn't like starting out with nothing, um, but they also didn't want to start out with all the rules because they wanted to discover them along the way. Um, that's, that's one little example. You asked about, I guess, permanence as well. And that, the, and that was one of the most brain-burning aspects of designing Charterstone, and one of the reasons why I may not design another legacy game in the future just because thinking through all the permutations, whenever I make a design decision, I have to decide how it, I have to think about how it's gonna impact all the other branches in the game, knowing that players might be unlocking those branches at different yeah. times. Um, so there were moments or hours where I would just kind of sit and stare at a piece of paper and, and just like try to calculate <laughs> what the smallest change would mean for the game. Um, so I, I, yeah, I spent like 18 months doing this. Have, yeah. you, have you considered doing a uh, designing a legacy game, or is that something you're interested in? <laughs> I'm interested in playing them. I'm still not convinced I would be able to <laughs> to manage it. Um, I have some ideas about how it might work for a particular upcoming title I'm working on, but it's yeah, it's so far off at the moment, and uh, I need more. I think I need more experience as a player. I love the idea of campaign games, you know, which is what we played as kids. I played Hero Quest and stuff like that, which were very simplistic. Um, I guess legacy games really because you get the same character, you know, over the course of adventures and stuff, but not in the way that we expect legacy games like Pandemic Risk and, of course, uh, Charterstone now, which introduce whole new elements that can either switch the game or undo something that you're expecting, you know, was once a positive thing is now longer, you know, in the next game is suddenly a negative thing. And the back and forth on that is um, is huge. But I guess, you know, you, you have quite a... I'm assuming, Jamie, a, a huge sort of team of playtesters and, and willing volunteers to, to go through all that with you now. I noticed as well, um, did you, Isaac Childress was listed as a, a, maybe a consultant or something on Charterstone. So were you pulling on, on um, sort of fellow experts like that for uh, support and for help with the designs? Yeah, I did. So with Charterstone, before I entered blind playtesting, I decided to um, send the game to a couple different people that I considered developers for the can for the game. One one of them being Isaac Childress. There was also uh, J.R. Honeycutt, who's worked on other legacy games, and a couple other guys. Um, and so I basically I would I would put together a prototype and I would send it to them for a weekend and just say, "Hey guys, play it as as many times as you can this weekend. I'll pay you for your time um, and." And your expertise, and send me some some feedback, uh, which was very generous of them to do. I, this isn't something that Isaac does. I'm sure he doesn't have any time for, to do that now. But I, I think yeah. he was busy even at that time as well. Um, some of the other guys, Jr. Honeycutt, he's made that. This is his job. This is what he does for a living. Um, but so I, it was kind of a different way for me to start out that blind play testing process because I, I needed other people to play it. Um, who hadn't already played it because it's a legacy game. I needed them to be surprised and have those discoveries. But also I wanted people who were considered, who, who I held in high esteem within the, the legacy realm. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. And they'd be able to feedback on the mechanics and the yeah. nitty gritty as well. Yeah. Exactly. Isaac did not like it. Isaac did not like it at all at that oh, time. Oh, really? No. Yeah, he was. He gave me some, some some very blunt advice that really helped me move forward with the game. Um, yeah. But he, yeah, he, he really, really did not like it. <laughs> he's a lovely bloke but he says what he thinks oh yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> he had similar feedback from my kickstarter page when we were launched <laughs> hey, he doesn't mince words some... <laughs> yeah but sometimes you do need the feedback of someone that might not be your target audience you know yeah. someone that's going to look at it from a very objective opinion um and then you get the you'll get the best feedback if you like it or not really um and that's it's great that you can take it separate it from your personal feelings about the game and say right well you know you've made a valid point here but maybe not here and i'm gonna use this to progress the game i think that's um I think that's fantastic so um move it moving back to cypher a little bit um for, for me the solo rules to cypher are absolutely incredible you brought in the game mechanics of automas um we've had um martin peterson on the show before um, so listeners can go back and listen to that if they want to. But um, you worked with him in order to bring um, the solo rules into Scythe. So first of all, why did you want to invest so much time and effort into the solo rules for Scythe? And how was it working with enough game designers to create a system that was so robust? Well, I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. And I'll pass that on to Morton and his team because they work really, really hard to get um, Automa... Uh, solo variants of our games in such a way that you feel yeah. like you're playing against a living opponent. That's their goal. The, uh, at least a living opponent that you don't have to do maintenance for. for. Mm. Um, Morton kind of convinced me after... It was when I was working on Tuscany, the, the Viticulture expansion. Yeah. Morton convinced me that there was a significant audience of solo gamers. I'm, I'm not a solo gamer myself, so I, I wasn't even aware of how robust that community is. Um, or that's that it could have it? a uh, that it could make a dent in sales, uh, which is you know I'm I'm a designer but I'm also a publisher so I'm always looking at you know will this will this appeal to people am I gonna will this help revenue things like that yeah yeah and uh, and so Morton convinced me of that and I and he proved it through Tuscany and he kept proving it for every game after that including Scythe where it yeah. it, it it just uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, people like you who, who, have, who have played it and, and, and enjoyed it because that option is there in the game. Yeah, the like you're saying, the solo market is huge and it's um, surprising really because when I started playing board games, I was like, well, it's great to play them after meeting Tristan, you know, get introduced into a games group where you can play regularly with three or four other people. But then you'll get home and you'll have a game on the table. And it's like, well, you know, there's only me and my wife and she doesn't really look like she wants to play this. So what are we going to do? <laughs> and it's great to be able to roll out these games that have these like, you know, great solo um, rule sets because then you're not feeling like you're just having to go through the motions and pretend to be the other player and you know what you're doing. If it's you're just following like a logic tree, then you, it's com it can be completely unpredictable and it, it really does like, you know, bring the game a new dimension. Yeah, you're not just learning how to play. It's it's a whole new challenge mode. Yeah, it? definitely. I was surprised actually that you um, did it with Charterstone as well, Jamie, because that's, you know, if, if we, we were just talking then about the logistics of developing and uh, ensuring that a legacy game is robust, but then to add the AI element to it as well. And, and I can't even imagine what uh, Monrad and the guys must have gone through to, to make that work. Um, but no, it's, I think it's an epic achievement. And also, I've, I've always played solo games because my family never really liked board games <laughs> growing up. So I had to design like my own rules for Hero Quest to be played by itself and things like that. Um, but I remember when, I think I must have registered on Board Game Geek back in about 2005, any question about solo gaming was met with derision, you know, and like, you've got no mates, get alive kind of thing. Um, whereas now there's guilds on Facebook and Board Game Geek that have like 10,000 members, you know, dedicated just to solo gaming. So it certainly backs up what you were saying earlier about um, proving is the market there. Right. Oh, yeah, I totally agree. Uh, and I, I think certain companies, like I think it's Van Ryder Games, they've had some campaigns, Kickstarter campaigns for solo-only games that have been very successful. I think that's probably opened the, idea, the eyes of other uh, publishers to that world. Definitely. Yeah, we had uh, Artem Safarov on... Yeah. Uh, a few weeks ago with Unbroken, 16,000 yeah. backers or something by the end of it. That was crazy. That's incredible. And that's solo only, yeah. Um, anyway, moving on <laughs> from, from solo games. <laughs> what would be your dream IP to work with, Jamie, if you could uh, play in any imaginative arena? Is the one that you uh, would would want to? 
I don't know if, if you guys are setting me up for an answer that you already know, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you know because it, over the last year I've been working on an IP that I haven't revealed or that I hadn't revealed for quite some time. It's an IP that I absolutely love. And after trying and trying to make a game of it, um, and I, I was in contact with the owner of the IP as well. The, it's a it's a book series called Red Rising. Have you guys heard of that book series? I have. I don't want to give too much away here, but only um, from following you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and the I've dipped in and out of following the discussion and everything, but um, I seem to remember at one point you'd kind of reached an impasse on it and perhaps weren't going to move ahead with it, right? Right, yeah. Um, yeah. I, so presumably that's been solved and you're moving forward. Well, not necessarily. Um, but but yeah, you're right. I, I, I've been working on it and working on it and I and I couldn't get it to work. And very, very frustrating because I, I love this book series so much. Um, but I ended up kind of just almost coming clean to our followers and I was like, you know, I, you know I've been working on this IP. Here's the IP. And... I, I'm just going to have to give up on it because I can't get it to work. And what really surprised me out of those conversations was that a ton of people said, well, what if I give it a try? Um, and people who had read the books, who hadn't read the books. And so we have started getting submissions from designers who have who either were Red Rising fans or who discovered it through my uh, my videos or my, my conversations about it, which I love. I love that more people discover the books through those conversations. And so we're yeah. getting submissions and I'm – well, I don't know anything for sure um, – it, I, it's seeming perhaps a little, a lot more likely than than a few months ago that we will at least have something to present to the author of Red Rising, uh, Pierce, to uh, to see if he is okay with us proceeding with a game not designed by me but by another designer. Fantastic! So you awoke the Kraken of the yeah, community, yeah. and they uh, they brought ideas forward. That's phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Again, totally ties back to what you were saying before about it being a collaborative community. And hats off to you for you know, be, being open to the community to submit ideas and things like that. To, and also for having the, um, for want of a better word, balls to sort of say, <laughs> you've been working on this idea and it's just not working for you. I I could list, I won't, but I could list um, people who've obviously got to that stage and then produced the game anyway <laughs> um, and games that I've played, you know. So um, so I think it's fantastic that, you, you know, you're, you're bold enough to say, okay, this isn't working for me. Perhaps we can still make the project happen, though, just because of how you are, how passionate you are about the source material. I think that's fantastic. Well, thank you, thank you. Yeah, that was, it was a, it was neat to see people rally around the idea. And I think it, it just goes to show when you find, um, you know, there's a piece of pop culture that you're really invested in, you kind of attract other people of, of like mind as well. Yeah, so it's great when you, as a fan, you meet other fans or you can create fans, and then you know, everyone's just going to jump on board, aren't they? Everyone everyone likes to just get involved in things like this. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And and um, something else that comes from Kickstarter especially. Well, I know I know we were talking outside of Kickstarter at the moment, but that um, community development where people are throwing ideas in for what they think might be in, or should be included in the game and stuff. And sometimes you have to pan through that to get the gold. But um, out there, you know, there's tons of creative individuals that are um, coming up with the goods and stuff. So... Yeah, brilliant that you've kept your ear to the ground there and, you know, bringing, hopefully bringing someone else up through the ranks of game design. Well, speaking of, like, bringing people up through the ranks, um, Jamie, what would you, who would you say would be the game designer that inspired you to pull out a pen and paper and start designing your own games? Hmm, that's a good question. I, I, probably the closest would be Uwe Rosenberg um, because uh, Agricola was one of the games that got me into Euro games as an adult. Yeah. And I, I've got to credit Rob Davio as well of Risk Legacy and other legacy game uh, yeah. designs because he he's that really changed the way I look at I looked at games. Um, had, had a huge impact on me. Yeah, he kind of turned things upside down, didn't he? He did. He really did. Yeah. It was like a like deck building being introduced with Dominion and then everyone piling <laughs> yeah. on that. Um, it's it's but again a great position that we all stand in now where we can stand on the shoulders of these other giants that are coming up with these great ideas and then you know rolling with them and and hopefully creating new good stuff definitely which are your favorite games at the moment jamie what you're playing what's uh what you're excited about as a player most recently i played terra mystica or not terra mystica uh, terraforming mars um not new to me but but uh you know i played it a number of times and just happened to get to the table on sunday have you guys played that that? yes yes Yes. yeah it was excellent (laughs) 
We've had, we've, yeah, we did a show about that. Um, it's one of those, it's, um, it comes together from a lot of disparate parts. Like, I, I don't know if I'm a massive fan of the components, for example. It's, it, you know, it certainly wouldn't um, hold water as a Stonemaier game, um, like with, with the artwork and the cards and stuff and everything. But the way the actual gameplay comes together in that feeling of... Thematically, like, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't no, it's it? A, it's a yeah. really, it's a, it's a good, game. it's a good um, brain burner as well. You can get <laughs> yeah. really involved. What what are your favourite types of mechanics in games, Jamie? Like, because that's very much sort of um, where you you're creating. You've got the sort of worker placement element, but it's mostly yeah, but like you're drafting creating, as well, drafting cards and yeah. having um, yeah, building <laughs> building the world really. And then rushing for milestones as well. It's a few different pieces bolted together, isn't there? Yeah. Is is there a sort of default mechanic that you go to, Jamie, when you're designing a game? Mm, not necessarily when I'm designing, but when I'm when I'm playing, I, I love engine building. I love anything that makes me feel like I, I'm more powerful at the end of the game than, than yeah. at the start. Um, I generally like worker placement, and I love um, I cut you choose mechanisms in games. Like uh, Castles of Mad King Ludwig has been near the top of my list for quite some time. It's not quite I cut you choose, but it has that you know I, I price you choose mechanism. I see. Yeah, I've not I've not actually played that game yet, but I know um, okay. another podcast um, should have been sit down had a rave reviews about it in the podcast. It sounds like an awful lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, and also I have to give a shout out to Time Stories. Time Stories is my number one favorite game. I, I truly love it. Oh wow, that is interesting. Yeah, yeah we have we played through the very first um, scenario of that. Um, I think that was Dave's copy, wasn't it? So it was, yeah. our friend brought it around and we, and we played it through. And I w- it was a great experience. It was fantastic trying to solve the mystery and everything. But then I was shocked that um, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> you have to buy the next yeah. uh, episode sort of thing, which, I, you know, that, I guess that works. But that was, a, that was an eye-opener. I didn't, I didn't see that coming. At, <laughs> yeah, at the, t- at the time, that felt really fresh, though. It was like um, you buy a game for its rule set and then you buy any extra modules, you know, a bit like D&D, but you play yeah, it much quicker. Yeah, D&D module. Yeah, but now there's all the escape room games. So I actually bought one of those at the last expo we went to. Um, so those are very much like play it once and you've burned through it and you have to go out and buy the next one. Um, and it's... I suppose it's you know it, it keeps the game fresh. I keep coming back to it. So, Jamie, do you do you go through each um, each module again and again, or do you just love collecting them all? Um, I usually I actually don't even own the game, but I'm usually the one in our group to buy the expansions as soon as they come out. In, in my mind, I treat it a little bit like a movie, a movie that I can yep. influence and in and be a part of. Yeah, whenever a new module comes out, I usually buy it um, and and nice. we get together and, and play it uh, with. We usually play with more than the actual player count, um, just because more people can, you know, with cooperative games that can, that can happen. But yeah, we yeah, yeah. Yeah. just w- developing the story together. So like. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, but no, we don't play more than once. We just play each one one time, and then it usually it ends up getting passed around to other friends. Yeah, but I'm okay with that. That's the best way. Yeah, just you play it, look after it, right? Get it on eBay or give it to a <laughs> friend. EBay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you're up to date with all the expansions on Time Stories, then, Jamie? I am. I am. Yeah. I. I yeah, it, it's one of those. And are, they, yeah. the, are they consistent in quality as well? They vary. They they have different designers. They do vary a little bit, but I, I would say every one has at least, uh, definitely at least one memorable moment. And I love memorable moments in games. And at least one has yeah. every one has at least one interesting mechanism that I think is unique to that scenario. Excellent. It's a good campfire fodder, isn't it? You can sit down and just debug the game afterwards and yeah. talk about your experiences. Yeah. I'm sold. Um, we're going to have to get another expansion. We'll get Dave to get so another expansion. It sounds expansion. like we're going to have to get another six. <laughs> cool. Okay. Well, I'm conscious of your time here, Jamie. So I was just going to ask, can you tell us more about your forthcoming games and future projects outside of Red Rising? Um, I, can you give us all the spoilers for Rise of Fenris right now? <laughs> yeah, you did. You mentioned Rise of Fenris earlier, and I, I appreciate you doing that. That's our, our, our new and final Scythe expansion, which is, while it's not a legacy expansion, it does have elements of discovery and it does uh, gives players the option of playing a campaign. It's an, either an eight-game campaign, or you can just dive in and unlock everything up front and mix and match it as you play side. It's kind of up to the players how they want to uh, play the game that way. But that'll come out in, um, in early August, in mid-August. I am all over that. I can't wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't fit it all in the box, in the base box anymore. I tried. Uh, the wind gambit was the limit for me, but no, I'm, I'm incredibly excited for that one. Cool. Yeah. So that's the, that's the next big one on the horizon. And are you betting down on the next projects after that, or is it all top secret? Well, it it'll be an interesting uh, 
12 months for my company because for the for the next 12 months we have three new games that are coming out and none of them are designed by me they're all designed by other designers where we've signed the game and i've helped develop it but but i'm not the designer so you've swapped your designer hat for a publisher hat now to a certain extent yeah but i am still working on um, currently i'm active acti- actively working on two and a half games two that i think definitely will get published one i think is on the fence um, and so those games will come out probably in late 2019 and probably one in 2020. Um, I'm working on my first cooperative game, actually, Tristan. So I, I probably need to play Gloom of Killforth to, to get some good, good advice on how to, how to do that. Nice plug. We'll, we'll use that. That'll be the sting for the show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mistake man needs to play Gloom That's... of Killforth. It can be played competitively, though, if you do prefer. Just, just it can. So, okay. so oh, cool. I can't wait to see the box of the reprint. It just says Jamie Stegmaier, and it's like, I should probably play this. <laughs> <laughs> Bigger than the actual name Gloom yeah. of Killforth. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Cool. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Jamie, for coming on the show. I, I guess probably um, people should know where can they reach you? Where's the best place to get hold of you if they want to find out more about you, your blog, your book, and your games? Sure. Yeah. The the, the hub for everything for, for my company and me is StowmeyerGames.com. And so there you can, if you want to read my Kickstarter lessons blog, that's there. You can also see all the other places. Like there's, I have Facebook groups for each of our games. I'm active on Instagram and Twitter. All those different places, but it's all the, the hub of it is stillmeyergames.com. Fantastic. Okay, we'll, we'll get that link in the podcast as well. Um, and yeah, so thank you once again so much for sharing your time with us, Jamie. Really appreciate you coming on the show today. It's, uh, it's great to get all your insights and uh, also to, you know, hook up with one of the, d- the giants in the industry. <laughs> yeah, and thank you for being so candid and uh, generous with the information as well. You know, you've been very kind in sharing a lot of information with us today. My pleasure. It was a wonderful speaking with you guys. It was great thank to speak you. to you too. Well, take care. Thank you. Take care.